Today is baby dedication day. We take some time. We try to do this uh, uh, twice a year uh, just to welcome the new lives into our church and to celebrate with our you know, families of the church who have um, had additions and just to, to pray with them and encourage them in this uh, adventure called parenting. When my children were first born, I was one of those lost parents. How many of you were one of those lost parents? Like you didn't know how to do anything, okay? I didn't know how to do anything. I had never babysat a child. I had never changed a child. I had never fed a child other than myself. I, you know, I hadn't done any of those things. And so when our children came along, I didn't know anything. I needed one of those um, Babies for Dummies books. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that's what I really needed here. I came across a few of these. Some of you, you may have already seen some of these pictures here, but if I even had a few of these, this would have helped me out a lot. Just see if you struggle with some of this. So the pictures here I want to show you. This first one is how to wake a baby. There's a nice kiss on the head or the air horn. Arr, get up, baby. That's kind of the wrong way to do that. All right, the next one here. We have drying the baby. Uh, <laughs> 30 minutes on fluff and they're good as gold, you know? Uh, not the way to do it, you know? Soft padding there. Okay, next one here. Bonding with the baby. Nuzzling up there or over a cup of coffee? <laughs> I don't think caffeine in the morning is the best thing for a uh, little baby. All right. Here we go, this next one. Calming the baby. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a soft pat's better than wild turkey, okay? I'm just, I just saying, that's not the way to calm the baby down. All right. Now, you laugh at that, but when I was, seriously, when I was a little kid, and my family was not Christians, when I was a little kid, I mean, like little, like maybe two years old or something like that, just barely to walk. Like the cousins got me and my brothers drunk and threw and hit us with pillows to knock us down. It was like baby bowling. So you think that wouldn't happen, but in my, my family it did. All right, washing the baby here with nice cloth or just out in the backyard with the garden hose. Yeah, roll over. You're looking good. Not the way to do it. All right, next one here. Lifting the baby. Uh, <laughs> Come on, baby. Hey, over here in the card seat. You're good to go. Yeah, we don't lift uh, that way. All right, here's this one. Putting the baby to bed. <laughs> now, some of you may be tempted to have a little peace and quiet, but you do not put the baby in the dresser drawer. All right, you uh, put them in the crib there. So, yeah, wrong way of doing that. All right, one more here, I think. Playing with the baby. <laughs> The point of this is to hold on to the child, okay? But about every dad I know takes their baby and does this. I know this because my dad is six foot four, and when Katie came along, he, he threw her into the ceiling. He was like, eh, conk, put her head right into the ceiling there. So, uh, yeah, good way to play with baby, bad way to play with baby, all right? Some of you might need this book. I don't know if some of you new parents, maybe we should have got a different book for you than uh, the Bible here. But we struggle sometimes knowing how to raise a child. How many of you would agree that parenting is hard? How many of you wish you had a manual for your child when they came out? Yeah, you know, I do too. James Dobson said this, parenting is not for the weak at heart. And I have to agree with him. As a parent, you have the awesome responsibility of taking a child whose mind is empty of the knowledge of anything and give them the knowledge of the world and the knowledge of God and teach them to become who God wants them to be. I think that the most uh, hard thing or even maybe the most difficult thing is being a parent. I think that most parents probably do okay at teaching their children how to survive in the world. We teach them how to go to school and read and write and that sort of thing. We teach them how to play with each other and, and that sort of thing there. But we often lack teaching them the things of God. We, we seem to fall away from those things. When they leave our homes at 18 years old, hopefully they can drive. <laughs> hopefully they understand the concept of working and earning a living. And I think by the, uh, <clears throat> by the looks of it, most of our children do. But they don't have the ability to sometimes stand up against the pressures of the world on the foundations of God. Statistics even show that, that even ch children who have grown up in the church, almost three quarters of them will fall away from their faith when they go to college. They reach a, a place in their life where mom and dad is no longer influencing them in their faith. They have to stand on their own. And they're oftentimes finding out that they don't have anything to stand on. They lack a biblical footing needed 
to withstand the pressures of worldly living and an anti-God rhetoric that they will receive almost every single day on any given college campus in America. That's one reason why I believe it is so important that we parent with the purpose of God in mind. We need to prepare them for college and careers, yes, but we need also to prepare them <coughs> to live a life in the light of God. And to do that, we have to be purposeful about teaching them who they are, who God is, and the relationship between two of them. Let me just ask you a question. If you've ever been forced to do an action that at the time seemed just uh, useless, seemed like it had no purpose, you ever done that before? You know, someone makes you do something a certain way. Coaches do this all the time. They make the players do a certain drill over and over and over and over again. And after a while, the players start to kind of revolt a little bit. And they think, why is the coach having us do this? And it's only on the game, on, on, on game day hour, that they realize, oh, there was a purpose for that drill because now I instinctively move a certain way. I instinctively know to run this play. I instinctively know to act a certain way. And the Word of God is the same way. If we are not training our children over and over and over again in the things of God, they will not instinctively know how to respond to that. When a crisis comes up in their life, they will, they will just have a knee-jerk reaction as opposed to saying, oh, God's Word says this. There's a Bible verse that speaks about that. There's a way in which God wants me to deal with this. Folks, as parents, we need to have that same kind of purposeful attitude when we parent our children about the things of God. We need to pray so that our children will learn to trust in the Lord and in times of trouble. We need to read the Word of God so that our children will learn that He is the source of knowledge and the way for guidance. I am convinced that if we are not purposeful in our parenting, that we will easily skip over the things of God and our children will be the ones who suffer. So let me just take a moment this morning to just walk through, if you're a parent here today, and I'm in the same boat with you, don't, all, don't do it all right all the time, but we can kind of walk through some things together. I just want to give you three or four things that the Bible says about ways we can be purposeful in walking through teaching our children the way of God. And I want to lift it from Psalm 78. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Psalm 78. I'm just deal with the first four verses here. Psalm 78 says this, O my people, hear my teaching and listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, from the, uh, hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known and what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from the children and we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and of His wonders that He has done. Let me just tell you, here's the first thing you need to write down. Teach our children about the greatness of God. We have to teach our children about the greatness of God. He talks about in this passage here how uh, he wants to share not those hidden things, but he also wants to share the things that they've heard, the things that they've known, the things that their forefathers have told them. <clears throat> have you experienced God do some great things in your life? If you have, then why not share that with your child? Have you told your child how God answered one of your prayers? Have you shown your child how God carried you through a hard time? Have you shown your child how God put maybe a marriage back together, a relationship back together, or healed some friendship that you thought was over with? You see, we have to share the greatness of God with our children, how God is moving in our lives. When I was a young boy, I wanted to be a lawyer, and I even thought at some point I wanted to be in politics and wanted to be the president of the United States. I'm not sure I really have that dream so much anymore. I'd like to be in politics, I think. I can talk, you know, <laughs> and that's about all you got to do in politics, you know. I feel your pain, you know. If I can do that, I can be, I can be in politics, you know. No new taxes, read my lips. You know, I can do it all. I can I could be in politics there. I thought I wanted to do that at one time. And the thing was, the reason I wanted to do that was because I remember reading these little books in grade school, and uh, the book I read a lot was about Abraham Lincoln. And I was really taken in by his life. And I, I like the fact that he kind of, you know, grew up on, out in the woods and that kind of thing. And, and I like that sort of thing there. And, and I read about how he learned to read and how he taught himself to read and reading books by, by candlelight or by the fireside there. And, and then getting involved in uh, uh, becoming a lawyer and then running for Congress and those things. And yeah, he had some setbacks, but he eventually became president, right? And we honor him today. 
And I, I was drawn to him because of all the great things that went on in his life. I just wonder, are we teaching that to our children? Because God's much greater than Abraham Lincoln. I mean, God's much greater than anybody of history. And we ought to be teaching our children to draw back to the things of greatness. See, we will gravitate to those things that we see as being great. Job said this, how great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. The psalmist will say, so great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Psalm 31 says, how great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men and those who take refuge in you. Psalm 57 says, for great is your love. It reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Sounds like the lyrics to a song that we sing. The Bible is full of passages that talk about the greatness of God. And if we believe in the greatness of God, then we need to pass along that belief to our children. When we teach our children about the greatness of God, we are also teaching them to honor and to respect God. And even desiring to be like God in holiness and righteousness, we need to teach our children to be all inspired by God. Now, a second thing that is important is this. We need to teach our children the Word of God. It's one thing to know about God. It's another thing to know the Word of God. I meet people all the time, and you have too, who say, oh, I know God, I, I believe in God, but they don't know anything about God because they want to quote that Bible passage, God helps those who help themselves. You're laughing because some of you are like, where's that in the Bible? It's not in there. The Bible, is, the, the, real, the reality of the Bible is God helps those who cannot help themselves. Sinners. That's why the Bible says, why we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. But we like to quote Benjamin Franklin, and we forget that he was like the 14th apostle. He is not. <laughs> we think that we know God, but we do not know the word of God. Psalm 78, verse 5 and 6 say this. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would what? What does it say? Would what? Would know them. Even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. He says, you teach your children so that they will teach even the children yet to be born. Do you ever think about your great-great-grandchildren if you don't have them? You ever think about how they will live? I don't even have grandkids yet. I don't want grandkids anytime soon. <laughs> Just saying, guys, all right? <clears throat> but I think about my grandkids. I think about the day when my grandkids will come and say, Grandpa, tell us that Bible story. Tell us the stories that you told mom and dad when they were little. Do the voices that you used to do. I look forward to that day, but I also think about what will life be like for them? What will their challenges be? How will they stand up again? The, the idea is that my children need to know the Word of God now so that they can teach my grandchildren because I want to see my grandchildren in heaven. I want to see my children in heaven most days. I mean, you know, um, I want to see my children in heaven. You want to see your children in heaven. You want, some of you want to send your children to heaven right now. I understand that. That's a whole nother sermon. But don't you want to see your family? Don't you want to someday when your great, great, great grandchildren come and say, I am so glad that you broke the cycle in our life, that you taught mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and, and go all the way back, that you, you taught them Jesus. Because on that day, when God calls them home and they have an appointed time, when God calls them home, they will know that someone thought about them in the future. We need to teach our children the Word of God. There were three men that were hiking one day. They came along this large river, and they needed to get to the other side of the river, but they didn't know how to do that. And so the first man said, he prayed out, he said, God, give me the strength to cross the river, and poof, right away, God gave him these massive arms and these strong legs, and he swam across the raging river. It took him two hours to do it, but he got across Seeing this, the second man, he thought, hmm, that's interesting. I'll pray to God. He prays to God. He says, God, give me strength and give me tools to cross the river. And poof, instantly, God gave him strong arms. God gave him strong legs. God gave him a rowboat. And he rowed across the raging river. It took him 90 minutes, but he made it all the way across. Seeing that was going on, the third man said, ah, God, give me the strength, give me the tools, and give me the intelligence to cross the river. And poof, instantly, God made him into a woman. And she, <laughs> and she looked at the map, she walked upstream 50 miles, and she walked across the bridge. 
Life is, yes, yeah, so you women are like, oh, preach it, brother, preach it. Mm-hmm. Listen, Harry, he's preaching to you, you know. In life, we know that our children are going to face many raging rivers of many different kinds. And we need to work to give them the strength to try to cross those rivers. We need to work to give them the tools to help them get across the river. But more importantly, we need to give them the intelligence and the wisdom of God to get through this life. You know, Paul made this statement one time when he was talking about physical health and spiritual health. And since we're kind of on this big, biggest uh, loser kick right now, some of you for the, the photos and all. And um, you know, I told people, I'm not the biggest loser. I'm the weakest link of our team. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, but we're, we're kind of on this, we're kind of on this kick right now. And so everybody's kind of thinking about eating right and being physically fit and all that. And Paul says, you know, that's, that's, there's, that's good. There's some profitability in that, but it's more profitable to know the things of God. Because it doesn't matter how many miles you run, how many push-ups you do, or how much pounds you lose, this body is going to lie silent in the grave one day. So I'm going to go out with a bang. That's what I say. You know, I'm going to go out eating ho-hos and Twinkies. I, God's going to call me home when he's calling me home. And when he does, I'm going to be eating a Twinkie when he, when he calls me home. <laughs> you know? Don't follow me if you want to live a long life, okay? You know, eat your roots and shoots and alfalfa sprouts and all that. But I'm going to have cupcakes and oatmeal pies, all right? I'm off the team, you know it? <laughs> I've been voted off the island. The point, though, of all that is this. We need to teach our children the word of God. Psalm 119 says this. David understood this when he faced the river. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? The question is, how can you do this? It's a rhetorical question because David answers by saying, by living according to your word. With all the advice that you give your children, nothing will be more powerful and more purposeful than to teach them the word of God. Psalm 119, 105, we love this passage. It says, your word is a light to my feet and a light, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word guides me. When you're struggling about something, the Bible should be the book you go to to find out what the next answer is. When you're in a dating relationship and you're asking yourself, God, is this the one? The Bible speaks about that. It says, do not be unevenly yoked. If the person you're dating doesn't believe in God and you do, that's unevenly yoked. If the person you're dating doesn't have righteousness on their mind and you do, that's unevenly yoked. If you can't worship the Lord together, I would say that is unevenly yoked. I wouldn't get involved in that relationship. It will only bring heartache to you. If you're thinking about a job where, uh, you know, the, what I should do on this job, the Bible speaks about it. The Bible talks about, uh, about being, con being uh, content with your wages. The Bible talks about not, not uh, abusing your power. Are you going to be in a position where you're going to be called to do unrighteous, unholy things? Are you going to be called in a position where you're going to have to abuse your power or do some crooked sales or something like that? Then the Bible says don't be involved in that. Do not walk in the pathway of the wicked, it says. If you're struggling about putting a marriage back together because some infidelity has taken place, the Bible has something to say about that. The Bible says that, yes, God understands that this relationship would end, but God desires for there be restoration, extend forgiveness, extend grace, rebuild trust. The Bible talks all about that. Do you have a son or a daughter that's in the far country? You know, the Bible talks about that. It says, don't, fo don't follow them into the far country, but wait for them to come to their senses and then run after them and welcome them home. We love that story. We call it the prodigal son. You see, we need to teach our children the word of God because it will guide them in their lives. They can have the biggest muscles and all the tools, but if they don't have the intelligence and the wisdom of God, they're still just pretty stupid. And the world will swallow them up. Thirdly, we need to teach our children to trust God. To trust God. This is hard for all of us. doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. Something will come up in your life that will make it challenging for you to trust God. Psalm 78 verse 7 says, Then they will put their trust in God. Trust is a funny thing, isn't it? As children, <coughs> as children, we trust blindly without ever thinking about it. We, we don't really realize this sometimes, but we trust blindly. I used to throw my children up in the air, like the, the, past, the little thing said, don't do, right? I threw my children up in the air, and most of the time, my kids would do this. Eee. Eee. They didn't say, oh, wait a minute, Dad, if you throw me up in the air, I'm not so sure you're going to catch me, so let's think about this. They were just like, ah, Daddy, do it again. Hey, 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 you know. 
They just trust that you're always going to be there to catch them. They, they instinctively think dad is always going to be there to catch them. Mom's always going to be there to catch me. And they never worry about that until you, dr you drop them once. And they're like, ah, not doing this again, right? You know, <laughs> let's think about this. Let's play another way. Let me just hold on to your leg down here. It's all good. <laughs> Folks, God is your heavenly father and he's going to catch you. He's going to catch you every single time. The, we lose that kind of trust as we get older. We become cynical. You know why? Because dad's let us down and mom's let us down and grandpa's let us down and grandma's let us down and brothers let us down and sisters let us down and teachers let us down and preachers let us down and elders let us down and you can go down through the list. We let each other down and then we start to think, well, then God will let me down too. I can't trust in God. That's why your children need to see you trusting in God. Teaching them that though we make mistakes and we falter as human beings, God does not. Teach your children. If they never see you praying to God as a family for guidance through a tough situation, will they ever learn to get through a tough situation? Will they ever get through that, turn back and say, God carried us through? If you never seek out God's word or direction and stick with it, even though it's contrary to the world's views, how will they know to trust God when it's contrary to the world's views? If they never see you honoring God with tithes and offerings, then how will they ever learn to trust God with their finances to receive the blessing that God promises to them? The more they see us put our faith to the test and trust God, the stronger their faith will be the more ready they will be, the more willing they will be to trust in God through the tough times that will come to them. The last point I want to say this morning is this. We need to teach our children to obey God. It's one thing to know the greatness of God. It's another thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to trust God to do good things in your life. But then there is an obedience to God when God calls you to do something. Psalm 78 Verses 7 through 8 say this, And would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. <clears throat> Do you hear what he's saying? They would see all these things. They would not forget his deeds, but it says, but they would keep his commands and they wouldn't be like the generation before them who forgot everything, who were stubborn and rebellious, whose hearts were not loyal to God and whose spirits were not faithful to God. When you think about your grandparents, do you ever go, oh, they were just a bunch of rebels? They didn't care about God? They were far from God? Maybe your grandparents were that way. My grandparents were not Christians as far as I know. None, none of them were believers in Jesus. But I would like to have the opportunity to say, great-grandma, great-grandpa, great-great-grandma, grandpa, they were faithful to God. We got five generations of preachers in our family. We've got, well, they've been in the church since they, they were in the church as soon as they got off the boat with Noah. You know what I'm saying? You just, you just want to say, you know, we've had, a, that would be the legacy. But the Israelites didn't have that legacy. And that's why the psalmist says, learn then from their mistakes. You know that some things, the Bible, some things of the Bible, rather, cannot be taught by a lecture or a fancy chart or graphs. They can only be taught by example. And I think that this is one of those things, above all the other things, that can only really be taught by example, and that is obedience to God. Your children will learn from your behaviors more than they will learn from your words. I know that because I'm a preacher. And my kids hear me preach every Sunday, but they watch me live seven days a week. And my living does not always match my preaching. I'm not proud of that. Every preacher I know experiences that. Because how we are at home is often different than how we are here. I know that because my wife tells me, why do they get happy, Steve, and I get grumpy, Steve? I'm like, because they would fire me and you would not. You know, that's like... <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to give you grumpy Steve. I'm going to give them happy Steve, you know, and I'll be looking for a new job afterwards, I'm sure. But you know what I'm saying because you struggle with this in your life. You know, if you're a teacher, how you teach in the school and how you talk to your students in the classroom, I would dare say it's probably different than how you go home and would talk to your own children. How you talk to your own family. It's easy to put on this, 
this facade for everyone else and be something different. But the fact is that people learn from how you live more than from what you say. I heard it said this way that I would rather see a sermon any day than hear one. I'd rather see it lived out than preached to me. If you're trying to teach your children the Word of God, then you have to obey it yourself. And when you make mistakes, then you have to admit to those mistakes. I messed up. I struggled in this area. This is what God's Word says. Please forgive me. Let's move forward. Let's, let's make some changes here. I think that if you're not trying to do that, then you're missing the boat. And what your kids are learning is, they're learning all those very bad habits. And one day you're going to go, oh, but I told them to go to Sunday school. I told them to read their Bible. But you didn't go to Sunday school. You didn't read your Bible. You didn't go to church. You didn't change your language. You didn't give to God. You weren't compassionate. You were, they're going to learn all those other things. You remember, it's, it's probably been a couple decades ago now, so some of you may not remember this, but there was this commercial that came on, and it was about this young man, this young boy, he's a teenage boy, and um, you, you, some of you know this, right? You remember how the dad comes in the room and he finds the drug paraphernalia in, the, in his room, and his dad starts hounding him, you know, where'd you get this, and why are you doing this, and I can't believe you're doing this, and, and, he, and he wants to know, who's taught you how to do this? And you remember that? He was hounding him, hounding him, hounding him, and finally the young boy says, I learned it by watching you, Dad. And then it was like, then the kind of commercial just stops. There's a lot of truth to that commercial. When you get angry, like I get angry, and you lose your tongue, like I do sometimes, it shouldn't surprise me if my children, when they get angry, would lose their tongue. I don't want that to happen, but... Sometimes that's the example that we set. You see what I'm saying? I'm not proud of these things. I'm just telling you, this, that's the reality of life. And so you have to teach your children then to hold the tongue when you hold your tongue. To read the Bible when you read the Bible. To trust in God and to obey God because God says do this. There have been times in our life, and I've, I've said it several times to our family because I've heard the whole oh, preacher's kid kind of thing. It's like 50-50 with preacher's kids, right? That's what everyone tells me. You know, 50-50, good or bad. I, I hate those statistics. I'm like, well, with your kid, it's like 70-30, and it's on the negative side of things. That's what I want to tell them when they say that to me. I'm like, 70% they ain't going to turn out no good. You know, why? Because you sell cars for a living. I don't know. You know, whatever. Doesn't matter what your job is. You just put out that statistic and go, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, I read that. You know, and, you know, Car Living for Sales magazine today said your kids ain't going to make it. You know, whatever. <laughs> the point of that, though, is to say this. I tell my kids, there are things we do in our family, not because you're a preacher's kid, but because we are Christians. You should tell that to your kids. If you're an elder and you're doing something, you should tell them, we're not going to church tonight because I'm an elder and I have to impress people. We're going to church tonight because we're believers in God and we want to go worship God. Because if you say it's because I'm an elder or I'm a preacher, and then they will start to resent that. But if you say this is what a Christian does and that's why we do it, then it's like this is God. Take it up with him if you don't like it. See, teach them to obey the word of God, not because of a position, but because of a person, because of Jesus. I want to just kind of wrap things up here. Let me just draw this to a conclusion to say this. I know that parenting is not easy, and there's no guarantees of raising the perfect uh, child, never making mistakes. I've heard enough stories of preacher's kids who've turned out really bad and preacher's kids who've turned out really good. And I've listened to the lives of non-preacher kids and it's been just the same. Sometimes they turn out one way, sometimes they turn out another way, and sometimes it, 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 it's just their bent. It's their choices. So let me tell you as a parent, your kid's going to do what they're going to do. You can set the example, but at a certain point, they are accountable for their own actions as you were and as you are. But with God's word as our guide, his spirit as our strength, we can give our children the best foundation and then help them in making the best choices in their walk to walk in the ways of God. We only have them for a short time. We only are able to influence them in so many ways and we need to make the most of that. 
So I would challenge you to make the most of the opportunity to raise your child and do it while they're young. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It doesn't say that he'll never struggle. It doesn't say that he'll never go in the wayward country. It says when he's old, he won't depart from it. It means that when he's old, the wisdom of the word of God will come to him to say, ah, it wasn't so smart. Dad said don't do that, but I thought I was smarter than dad. But now I realize dad was smarter than me. And they come back. You ever notice that? The older you get, the smarter your parents got. You know what I'm saying Especially when you have a child and then you look at your parents and you go, was I like that? And they're like, no, you were worse. You know what I'm saying? They always say that. Because the older we get, the more we start to realize that life doesn't really change and generations are just the same and they are just like you were and they have to learn the lessons that you needed to learn and, the, and your grandkids and great everybody's got to learn those same things. So my point is this, train them up. More than likely, that's what the proverb is. Says. It's not a guarantee. It's a more than likely statement. More than likely, this is a good thing. They will come back. Do you have a wayward son? Keep praying for him. If you train him up in the way he should go, more than likely, when he is old, he will not depart from it. Hopefully, he comes back sooner. Hopefully, she comes back sooner. As we close this morning, we have several new babies that have been born in this last year, and we want to dedicate them to God. Now, I just want to say here that we clearly believe that every person must make a personal decision to accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This is not a baby christening. This is not bringing babies into the family of God. Every one of these little people need to make a decision when they are accountable to their Lord and their God. But we as parents and as a church family want to say we want to pray for these children and pray for these parents as they train up their children as they parent with a purpose. I'm going to ask the, the parents of the children to come up here. I've got a couple Bibles here. So we're going to ask for Noah and his family to come up here and Abby and her family to come up here and Laszlo and his family to come up here, and Arizona. I'm also going to ask John and Katie and Michelle to come up here with me as well. We're going to ask you to come up here on stage. And what we're going to do is um, we have a little uh, gift to give uh, to each one of these uh, young people. <clears throat> when uh, the kids were little, they can tell you this. We had a little, a little uh, baby Bible like this, you know. Uh, I still preach out of it from time to time. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> It'd be easier, right? <laughs> but uh, we, had, we had a Bible like this. And I, would, I, I was gone a lot when they were little. I was working. I was still in school. I was building a parsonage. I was doing a whole bunch of stuff. And I wasn't around. But I tried to make a point every night to come home and to read to them. I would pray with them and I would put them to bed. That's what dad did. Mom had them all day. And I got them when they were exhausted and prayed with them and put them to bed. But before I would do that, I would pray with them. And uh, I would read a story. And, and uh, <clears throat> you guys hold this here. I would read them a story, and uh, John's favorite story was what? Do you remember? It was Samson, because, or Samuel, not Samson, Samuel, because I would make the stories when God would call Samuel. I would, he'd be like, Samuel, and he would just giggle and be like, here God, here I am. Samuel, here God, here I am. He just loved that story, and so he would giggle uh, all the time. Katie's favorite story was? The birth of Jesus. She liked that because she loved the little baby. And so I'd be like, here comes the little baby. And then she had the little baby. And she would love the picture of the little baby. And they loved those stories there. And it was a great endearing time. And the reason I say that is because you guys are going to build those memories with your children with these little Bibles here. And I hope that uh, your children uh, grow up to love the Lord as you love the Lord, as my children love the Lord. And uh, it started with something very simple like that. So this is for Noah. And this is for Arizona. And this is for Abby. And this is for Laszlo. Now, what I'd like to do is um, we're going to pray right now for these families here. I'm going to pray for the dads. Michelle's going to pray for the moms. Katie's going to pray for the daughters that are here. And John's going to pray for the sons that are here. So let me just pray. Father God, I thank you for the families that are here today. And I pray especially today for the dads.
Father, it's, it's very challenging because you are the example of a heavenly father and it's really hard for us to live up to that. In fact, there's no way that we can. But Father, our children, the way they see us will directly affect how they see you. And so I pray for the dads that they live a life that honors you, that they trust in your word and they display that trust to their children, that they obey your word, Father. And that when, they, when, when their children look at them, they see a loving Father so that they will know that there's a loving Heavenly Father watching out for them. Father, when they stumble, give them the humility to say, I've made a mistake. And give them the strength to pick themselves back up and to continue to walk in your way and your righteousness. Never let them forget that they are the leaders of their household. They are responsible, Father, to train up their children and to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. May they set that great example. In Jesus' name I pray. Father God, I just uh, lift up the moms that are on stage today. God, what a privilege it is to be able to um, raise your children. Uh, Lord, we have them for such a short period of time, but you've entrusted us with them. And so God, I just pray that you be with them. It, uh, some days I know it feels like an overwhelming responsibility. It feels like there's no way I'm going to figure this out. One more diaper, one more cry, one more... Um, tantrum, uh, I'm going to lose it. And so, God, I just pray that you be with them as they enter those years of um, just learning to um, direct their will and not break it, learning to um, understand what their cries mean and what their vocabulary is and what they're trying to tell them. And God, I just pray that you be with them, that you allow them to um, always point their kids to who you are. Always uh, set an example by getting up early and praying over them and um, God, I pray that you just be with them in their relationship with their spouses. Um, God, sometimes I think the best examples that we can set is how we interact with um, our husbands. And so, God, I pray that you just be with them and you allow them to love their husbands wholeheartedly, that you allow them um, to defer to their husbands. Sometimes we come across decisions that we have to make in a family. God, I pray that they allow um, their husband to be the head of that ho household and that they show them respect and honor. Um, God, those are great gifts that we can give our um daughters and sons. And God, I just pray that you be with them. And in the days that they are completely exhausted, God, I pray that you give them the strength to make it uh, to the end of the day. And the days that they are um, completely overwhelmed by joy, God, I pray that you help them celebrate and say those quiet prayers of thankfulness. Um, God, just be with them. Allow them to honor you um, and the things that they do and the things that they say. Allow them to um, show that over and over and over again in times of trial and in times of goodness in times of sorrow, um, in times of difficulty, God, that they will always um, point their kids to who you are. God, I pray for these, um, these beautiful baby girls, and um, I just ask that you put people in their lives that will guide them and um, keep them um, facing you, and I ask that you guard their hearts, um, keep them pure, and um, just seeking your will. Um, God, I pray that if they fall short and they lose sight of you, that um, you work on them and you help them to find their way back. Um, thank you so much for them and just um, the great blessing that they are. Uh, God, I pray today for these uh, two little guys that are here with us. And I just ask that you can uh, allow them to, to grow up to be the, the men um, that you want them to be, that through them you can do amazing things and that um, they, can, they can stand uh, up for your word and, and know the authority and the power of it. Um, and I just ask that you can uh, allow them to, to live by it, to overcome all the different temptations that they're going to go through and the, the difficult things of trying to grow up in a world today, being a Christian where um, that's really hard and that's seldom heard of and uh, where there's not a ton of respect for God. And I can just, uh, I just ask that you can allow them to, uh, to just to overcome those things. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give these families a hand. We're glad that they're here. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We welcome you.
I'm going to ask our song team to come on up here as we prepare for our final song here. And um, I just encourage you uh, with all of this, just to say this, we have a lot of little people in our church, young uh, men and women, little boys and girls who, who need people to come and teach with them. In our fellowship hall, we've been averaging a little over in the 20s uh, on Sunday morning and different stuff here. And I would just encourage you, if you have a heart and a passion, and they're not your, maybe your own kids, you can still train them up in the way of the Lord. You can help make an influence. Um, my parents weren't Christians when I was little. The influence that was in my life was the people I found at church, my youth ministers, youth worker, uh, initially a guy who just brought us to church to play ping pong. That's all we did, ping pong and pizza. And I learned to be a person of God. So I would just encourage you to be involved in that.